Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, we are honored today to have uh, Hido Invens from uh, the Graduate School of Business and Department of Economics at Stanford at the uh, Distinguished Seminar here at the MIT. To me personally, it's a, it's a great pleasure to, to introduce Hido. He has been a, a co-author, a collaborator, like mentor and friend for, for many years. Like I was, you know, like very lucky to, um, you know, like a, to participate in many research projects with him. And, you know, we still have a weekly meeting where we discuss research. And, and I mentioned this because, uh, like, some months ago, like, I, we have this meeting with uh, Susan Aity and, and Jeff Woolrich. And some months ago, Susan could not be in the meeting because there was some, you know, like a professional honor or award that she was receiving. And the three of us kind of jokingly congratulated each other in that our life is much easier and less complicated than that. And we kind of jinxed it uh, in some way because like, uh, not uh, too long after that, like, uh, like uh, Hido received uh, the Nobel Prize and, and we were all very, very honored about uh, his life becoming much, much more, uh, very, very happy that his life became much more complicated. And um, it, is, um, it is difficult to express how um, you know, transforming his influence has been like in economics. Uh, the prize was given for like a, a methodological contributions to the analysis of causal relationships. I still remember when I sent, you know, my job market paper to a journal and, you know, they told me that's fine, but you have to, every, every instance where say causal causality, you know, like you have to remove. It's too much of a loaded term. We cannot use it in, we cannot use it in, in, in economics. You can see how you know the field have changed uh, because of the influence of the Hido's work. Like if you go to a seminar now in economics, people will be talking about you know the, the exact nature of the parameters that we are estimating and what type of a, you know um, you know like what type of variation in the data we are going to use uh, uh, to identify these parameters. And you may think that it was always like that, but it was not. I mean, it was it was the opposite of that. Okay, so like uh, Hido has been a, a true trailblazer and great intellectual leader. And, you know, from a more personal point of view, I can say that, uh, you know, the Nobel Prize and all the recognition couldn't have happened to a, to a nicer guy. Uh, so that um, I'm very happy about this. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Uh, Hido, please join me welcoming like, Hido. Um, thanks, Alberto. Um, Thanks for a very kind introduction. Uh, this, these weekly meetings uh, are one of the, the highlights of my week. Um, I think the things that keep me sane uh, since winning what uh, I've been a share of what, what my high school senior on Swedish TV called the fake Nobel Prize. Uh, uh, it's been a very interesting uh, uh, time. So one of one of the interesting things was also that uh, NPR the next day uh, said that, that Josh and I, Josh Angrist and I shared the, our part of the prize. There was also with David Cart, but we shared our prize of the, the part of the prize for our empirical analysis of cause of casual relationships. Uh, <laughs> and so. Uh, our, our wives were less impressed with uh, <laughs> with that part because that, that sort of went back a long way because when I was at the junior faculty at Harvard I started teaching a course on causal inference with, uh, with Don Rubin the registrar's office also thought that was probably wrong and they kind of the whole carefully crafted course description that had 10 times said causal was changed every time to casual uh, <laughs> which which made the very first meeting of the class uh, very interesting uh, with a very broad range of students. Uh, <laughs> we thought that this was a way of getting out of uh, statistics requirements. Uh, um, but so it's, it's just great to be back uh, doing these seminars in person. Uh, this was a trip I was supposed to do two years ago. The, and it was the first trip I canceled uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. And so it's just great now to be kind of retracing my, the steps I was intending to take uh, two years ago and um, uh, give this talk. So at the time, actually, uh, th this is a project I've been working on. Uh, and so there's a bunch of co-authors, uh, uh, Pat Byrie, Brian Burdick, James McQueen, Lorenzo Masvero, who was actually a PhD student here, Thomas Richardson, uh, 
who's at the University of Washington, Ido Rosen, so the, all the other courses actually at, at Amazon. This is from a project uh, I've been involved in at, uh, at Amazon. And we actually uh, started this a uh, long time, time a sort of reasonably long time ago. And it was, uh, from my perspective, actually, it's been the most exciting project I've been involved in uh, there at, uh, at Amazon. But for a while, uh, we were, they didn't want us to present it uh, outside because actually the, the internal people thought it was very cool. And they didn't, uh, they, they said, well, you know, we, we've got to keep it uh, quiet for a while. But now, uh, more recently, they decided, actually, they, now they let me get away with more. And so they, they said, you know, it's fine to present, uh, to present this. And so um, I, what I'm going to do is, is give a little bit of an introduction. And I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, standard experiments. And uh, then I'm going to talk about what we call these, uh, these multiple randomization uh, designs. And at some level, the, the main idea is, is very simple. I'm going to get it across in the introduction. And the rest is, is really kind of just about showing some of the, the possibilities uh, there. But we are nowhere near exhausting the, the possibilities there. From my perspective, the, the exciting part is really that we, this gives us a way of thinking about uh, doing much more complicated experiments than we've typically done, sort of at least in, in my experience. And from that perspective, it sort of fits in with, with kind of the, a lot of the modern literature where people have done more complicated experiments, including kind of a lot of adaptive uh, designs, uh, but kind of all things going beyond the type of stuff that Fisher and Neyman were doing in the 20s and 30s, where they would do these agricultural experiments where they would put fertilizer A on some plots of land and fertilizer B on some other plots of land and then kind of wait a year till the, and kind of measure these results. Kind of now you have all these sequential things, all the, the, band, the whole banded literature, the reinforcement learning literature, kind of there's all these exciting ways of doing much cl more clever, much more exciting uh, uh, experiments that allow us to, to learn many more different things and doing so much more efficiently. So here, the, as I said, I'm going to give the basic idea kind of very, very uh, quickly. I want to think about a setting uh, where we have two populations, uh, and later actually it can be more than two populations. Let's see, we can think about a setting where we have capital I customers and we have capital J products, uh, and we can measure some outcome at the level of the pair product customer. So we, you, know, you can think about how much do people spend in a year on a particular product or product uh, category. So it's likely in that case, the, or the, the outcome could be some measure of engagement. Or the, but it's likely that in many cases, these matrices are actually very sparse, that people don't buy the, a lot of products, but they're going to be buying more than one. It's, it's not the case that they just pick one particular thing. And so the, it's key that we can measure these outcomes kind of separately for every uh, single uh, pair. And you know, what we could do in that case, uh, uh, we could just aggregate things up by customers, and we could just do a customer experiment. Kind of, we're, we're looking at some intervention, maybe making a particular uh, uh, making products more uh, attractive to customers or make them look different or change something in, the, we in the, the website. But we're going to think about something that we can change, that we can separately manipulate, separately choose for every pair customer uh, product. And that, that's, that's going to be key. There's, there's settings where that's not possible kind of in a supermarket in a, in a brick and mortar store, I can't have two customers coming in at the same time and have them see different prices. You can sort of do that a little bit. You could give people discounts, kind of, but it's a, you know, in, in many of those cases, the experience for different customers would, would by necessity uh, be the same. But in online settings, you can make these experiences different. Uh, I can show, you know, if I, VRBO or the Airbnb, 
for the same customer and the same property, I can show it to you in different ways. I can give pictures or just verbal descriptions. I can include reviews for some people, but not for others. Uh, so there's lots of things where I can vary the experience at the level of the pair, in this case, customer product, but in, in the case of the Airbnb property and, and customer, or in the case of Lyft or Uber, driver, rider, kind of in all these cases where there's two sets of, uh, of the units, two sets of, of economic agents that interact in some particular uh, structured way. And so I could do a simple uh, kind of go back kind of to the fisher Neyman type experimental design and just randomize the, the customers and uh, give each customer a consistent experience so that in this matrix of assignments, every column is the same and every row consists of only control experiences or only treatment experiences. I could also choose to do things the other way and I could randomize the products uh, to that experience and give every product a consistent experience and give every customer the, the same experience across all the, the products. And so what the, what we're interested in here is going beyond that and kind of thinking of the assignment of the design of the experiment, not as the problem of choosing a vector of the controls and, and treated, or vector of zero and some ones, but thinking of the problem as a choosing a, a distribution for the matrix of the treatment assignments and control assignments. And so, you know, in some sense, once you kind of think of it this way, once you kind of realize that it's not a choice between either doing a customer experiment or doing a product experiment, but there's the possibility of doing the assignment uh, at the, so as a distribution over all the entries in this matrix. That's kind of the, the whole idea. That just gives us a lot of possibilities. And now, so the question is just, you know, what, what can we learn from these different uh, designs? And what would be good designs for learning about the, the questions we're interested in? In some sense, we're not particularly far along for that. We, we, could, we have some results for some of these simple the designs. But really, the key thing is the, that by doing that, we are creating multiple comparison groups that are ex ante the same, kind of at least in expectation, because of, no. So well, okay, let me step back. So here in this design, we randomly pick some customers, we randomly pick some products, and the selected customers will be exposed to the treatment ex treated experience for those selected products. And that generates these three comparison groups, these three sets of pairs of customers' products that are all in the control group, but that have different overall experiences. These green uh, Cs are customers who are in the control group for those products, but who sometimes have a treatment experience for other products. And so, for example, if the result of the treatment is that people switch from, from control products to treated products, those controls would be different from the red ones where both the customers and the products have a consistent experience uh, and where these customers never see the, the treatment. So if, if the treatment is, say, a fast shipping option and there's a lot of very similar products, if, if I have the choice between buying a, a coffee maker that gets there tomorrow versus two weeks later, then I might just switch. I'm not going to buy I'm not going to buy two coffee makers, but I'm just going to switch from the control one to the treated one. And similarly, for these blue Cs, the products are sometimes in the treatment group, and maybe the treatment made the products more attractive, and maybe the sellers are going to raise prices as a result, and so you're going to see a difference between the, the blue Cs and the, the red Cs. So the point is that 
the, the, one of the points of doing these designs is that we can learn more than we would learn from a standard ex experiment, where in this case, we only have two sets of, uh, we only have one comparison to make. We can only compare the controls to the, to the treated, and we cannot learn more. That we, can, we can only learn one uh, contrast here. In addition to comparing things to the treatment group, there's, there's uh, three comparisons that they add up. So there's really two separate comparisons we can make between control units. And that's going to tell us something we couldn't learn from these earlier experiments. Now, second point is, and that's kind of uh, argue that's a little bit more mundane. Once you do this, even if there's no spillovers, even if we're sure there's no spillovers, doing this is going to be preferable because it's going to allow you to learn the average effect of the treatment more precisely. Because by, in the absence of spillovers, the, the fact that you can use the same customers the, for different products as each other's control and the same products for different customers as each other's control allows you to get more precise estimates if there's a lot of differences between customers and a lot of difference, a lot of heterogeneity in, uh, in products. So you can get more precise estimates of the, to, uh, more precise answers to questions you're already interested in. But the, the more interesting thing is that you can get answers to different uh, questions than from standard designs. And so this is a very simple version of, uh, uh, of this, uh, this type of experimentation. You could do much more complicated uh, things. So for example, you could split the, the products into two uh, sets. Kind of, you could randomly split them into two sets. And now for one set, you could do a customer experiment. And for the other set, you could do a product experiment. And then again, generates uh, three different sets of pairs that are always in the control group that allow you to uh, learn about some of the spillovers. Um, but it also generates multiple treatment groups that have different experiences. And so what, the, what would be a good way of doing that it you know, depends a lot on which, which particular questions you're going to be interested in, what particular concerns you have about spillovers. Uh, and what, what is, at some level, to me, the most interesting thing is that now the, the experimental design is going to rely a lot on building the models for the, for the actual behavior, because you can't kind of be completely unconstrained. In some sense, you, it would be very nice if we could have a set of uh, products that has a consistent control experience and a set of products that has a consistent treatment experience, but at the same time have a set of customers that has a consistent control experience and a set of customers that has a consistent treatment experience. But that's, you can't get that because you can't have rows with all Cs rows with all Ts, and at the same time have columns with all Cs and all Ts. So you're going to need to build some models that limit the type of spillovers or that allow you to do some extrapolation. Uh, and so there's going to be a lot of questions how to actually do this uh, effectively. And I don't really have a, a lot of answers. It's kind of more that we, we, sort of, we were excited kind of to see that this actually just raises a lot of questions. Uh, a lot more than we have, have answers for. But so the, the, the goal is really to kind of try to understand what, what are sensible things to do in, in practice. And the exciting thing is that now the questions of what are good things to do are much more complicated. In a standard A-B test, kind of the natural thing is just to split things equally in a treatment group and a control group. And that's just a fairly close to optimal in a wide range of, of settings. But here, that's not the case depending on which spillovers are really important, you may, in, within this type of design, have most of the people in the customer experiment or most of the people in the product experiment. Or you could do it the other way around, where you split the customers in two groups and do customer and, and product experiments. Uh, and exactly what the benefits are and when one would be a good thing uh, relative to the other aren't really very clear uh, to us. 
But so within this, this context, what we're interested, the, one of the first questions is, what, what are we actually interested in? It may be as simple as we want to know what would happen if everybody, sort of all product customer pairs were exposed to the treatment versus no product customer pair was exposed to the treatment. And we just want to get the best estimate of that. What the answer to that is, is still going to depend on which spillovers you want to allow for. If you know there's no uh, within product uh, spillovers, you should just do a customer experiment. If you know there's no spillovers of the other type, you should just do a product experiment. But if you know they're both there, what, what would be the right thing to do? It depends on how. So, um, so the first question is, what are we actually going to be interested in? And that's going to be very context specific. But even if it's as simple as just there's one scalar thing you're interested in, like the average effect, average overall effect, the design question is going to be uh, tricky. The, and in many cases, we're also intrinsically interested in the magnitude of the spillovers. Because if we realize these spillovers are actually very minor, then in the future, we can do experiments in a much cheaper uh, way. So just look, getting that knowledge is very valuable. The second question is, how do we choose, how do we design the experiment? How to, do we choose the distribution of uh, the, the entries of this, uh, of this assignment matrix? Uh, how do we estimate things? And if we're interested in things like the average effect, we're still going to rely some on, on modeling this, on making assumptions, uh, on, ex at le on the, the very least on extrapolation. And um, we're going to be interested in how we do inference. Uh, and there, in some sense, there we, we do have some results. And they're, they're conceptually not all that difficult. Just like in the standard case, you can do randomization-based inference, and you're going to get similar things where you can't actually estimate the variance unbiasedly, but you can get the conservative estimators for the variance. They're looking much more complicated, uh, and it, it, there's still a lot of things to be sorted out. But those, those kind of are, in some sense, the easier questions. The more interesting things are how you go to what type of models would actually be useful here to uh, help in designing the, the experiments. And this is so where this is where the economics, in some sense, would come in, where you would need to think about how these interactions take place and which spillovers you're actually interested in. And I'm going to not do, go very far in that direction, partly because we don't really know exactly how to do that. Uh, so we look at very simple cases. But I think that's, that's kind of where the, there's a lot of interesting uh, questions. So now, let me just kind of briefly set the stage by going back to standard experiments. Uh, there we, we just have a single population. We, have, uh, we assign units either to the treatment group or the control group. Uh, we assume there's no spillovers. Uh, in that case, we are often interested just in the average effect across that uh, population. Once we do have random assignment, we just compare average outcomes for the treated and control units, uh, and we can estimate the, the variance uh, using the variation of the outcomes in the control group and the treatment group. And that's going to give us a, a conservative estimator for the, for the variance. Problem is that in these settings that I described, and that's, that's kind of not just Amazon type settings, but all these settings, all these online settings where there's multiple populations interacting, there's almost always going to be these, these spillovers because uh, they're, they're really intrinsic to these, uh, these marketplaces. Uh, that's why we have uh, these interactions. And so, for example, uh, treating one particular customer for one particular product may lead the, the seller to change their behavior, to change how they market uh, that, uh, that product. And that, so it may affect outcomes for other uh, customers for that same product. Another key uh, reason for the spillovers is that treating a particular product for customer I is, may affect the, the outcome for another product because customers just switch. Uh, and these standard experiments fundamentally cannot 
the adjust for that or, and cannot even detect that problem because they only allow for a single comparison between uh, treated and control units. And what, what this whole class of experiments is doing is creating these multiple comparisons uh, that allow us to kind of both detect the presence of these spillovers and then also allow us to, to uh, adjust for that under some assumptions. And what type of assumptions there are reasonable is, is not very clear. And I think that we, we, uh, you know, we look at some set of assumptions, but in general, this, this calls for more models that, that allow us to figure out from particular comparisons uh, what the, the things are we are we're interested in that allow for those, uh, the, the extrapolation and interpolation. So if we ge have general, if we have completely unrestricted spillovers, uh, we're not going to get very far because then at some level we only have a single comparison. Uh, so for example, if you're interested in the effect of treating everybody versus nobody, we can't learn anything about that if we're allowing for unrestricted uh, spillover. So we're going to need to build some, uh, to impose some limitations on these, uh, these spillovers. Um, here again are some, of, some examples of, of that. The, actually one, one other one that, that is, I've seen, up, seen come up in a, at a number of these, uh, these companies is that if you experiment with search algorithms even if you expose some customers to the new search algorithm and others to the control algorithm, the simple comparisons may not be enough because the results from the, for the treatment group, the search results for the treatment group, in the end lead to the changes in behavior for that group and that leads to new information being used in the algorithms even for the control the customers and so it's going to affect the control customers. Uh, and so again, you need to, to purge those effects if you're interested in uh, learning about the relative benefits of these, uh, these different um, algorithms. But in all these cases, there's really, there's various forms of feedback, there's various forms of equilibrium uh, effects where what you do to one group of, uh, of economic agents affects the other group through these, uh, these structured interactions um, in, the, in, in the particular case. So what are some of the things uh, that people have, have done before? One of the, the approaches that, has, that goes back a long way is doing uh, switchback or crossover experiments where you change over time the which units are in the treatment group and which units are in the, in the control group. And so in some sense that fits in with what we're doing here where we're, uh, we could allow for one of these populations uh, to be time units and so we could change the, so instead of having customers and products, we could have customer and, and uh, time periods. The, those, those, that type of experiment is actually being done a lot uh, kind of in, in some of these marketplaces. Uh, there's obviously many tricky things with doing this over time where you need to worry about the fact that uh, treating customers at a particular point in time may affect their behavior for a while, so you can't actually switch every five minutes. Uh, you need to have some burn-in time, uh, or some fade-out time for these, these things, but that's, uh, those are, are being done. There's also uh, what are sometimes called step wedge designs, or staggered adoption designs, where you increase over time what fraction of units is exposed to the treatment, so you never switch units back from the treatment group to the control group but you increasingly switch people from the control group to the, the, the treatment group. Another set of designs that is widely used is clustering uh, units. So for in a setting where it's products and customers, you may think that the spillovers within customers are really only within the groups of, uh, of products. Uh, if I uh, uh, want to buy a USB stick, all similar memory things should be in the same cluster, 
because I may switch between uh, different uh, products within that group. But if you change the, the, how attractive particular USB sticks are, that's not going to make me buy, switch to a coffee maker. And so if you, if you group these relatively broadly, then you may, uh, you may get a, rid of, the, of some of the, the spillovers. Now, recently, there's actually kind of a lot of uh, new work where people are also kind of doing what, what I kind of think of as in general as these kind of much more complicated uh, experiments. Uh, it's a paper by my Stanford colleagues, uh, Johari, Lee, and Weintraub, where they, they're looking at the biases kind of from standard experiments. And then they also discuss kind of the, the first version of these multiple randomization designs that I um, talked about. There's some work by um, Evan Monroe, Stefan Wagner, and uh, Kang Xu, uh, where they also model the interaction, where they model the interactions as coming through prices, and they look at experiments that allow you to separately uh, identify the direct effect of uh, treatments as well as the indirect effects through prices, where they kind of make sure that there's additional variation in uh, in prices. Um, there's this work by Backstrom and Kleinberg, kind of where they, they use a network structure to, find, to generate the clusters so that there's, little, uh, there's lower dependence uh, across the clusters. But I, th I think kind of all these papers are really uh, do very interesting things, kind of trying to get these experiments to be much more complicated to take account of the fact that it, there's these various types of uh, uh, spillovers uh, taking place. So what we're going to do here is kind of look at a setting where we have these two or more populations. And in all the, the examples, I'm going to look just at the case where there's two populations, uh, but it could also be products, customers, and days where you switch which uh, group uh, products or customers are, are in on different days. Um, and we're going to try use these uh, designs to either get more efficient estimates of the standard things. In the absence of spillovers, we're going to uh, use them to try to detect the presence of these spillovers in cases where we're worried about them. And we're going to try use them to adjust for these, uh, these spillovers, at least for limited versions of, uh, of them. And so the, the generic case I'm going to look at is, is where one of the populations is uh, customers and one of them is, uh, is products. And maybe the treatment is something that where we provide more information to customers when they, they're confronted with a particular product. So it could be more reviews. It could be pictures instead of just a written description. And we may be interested in the question what the average outcome would be if everybody was exposed to the treatment versus nobody was exposed to the, to the treatment. And the key things really are that we can measure some outcome for, in principle for every pair customer uh, product, even if it's zero for many of them. And we can measure the treatment, or we can assign the treatment separately for every pair of uh, the customer product. And in practice, it clearly would be beneficial to kind of combine this with bandit type uh, things. Often the customers would come in sequentially, kind of looking for particular products. And so you would probably get a lot of benefit from assigning them at the time they actually come in. But here I'm just going to look at the static version, where it's just you know, at the beginning we decide these customers are in the treatment group for these products and in the control group for these, uh, these other products. And so again, the treatment itself at the level of the customer and product is still binary. Even though in some sense, the, the, the terminology, some of the spillover literature sometimes, this is sometimes referred to as the exposure mapping. There's kind of the way in which the remaining set of the products for that customer is assigned comes in through some limited uh, that can be captured by some limited amount of information, maybe just a fraction of other products that is treated for a particular individual or the fraction of other customers that is treated for a particular uh, 
product. And so we, we're going to need to put some structure on, uh, on that. So now I want to uh, talk about these, these four uh, sets of, of these multiple randomization uh, designs. And I uh, uh, can talk a little bit about why they, they may be reasonable and, and what we can learn from them. Uh, and kind of what results we have for the different ones. So the first thing is that if, in fact, there's no the spillovers, if we're not concerned at all about the spillovers, we could do much better than just having a customer experiment or a product experiment. What we should do is randomize every uh, pair in a way that all the customers are balanced in the treatment and control and all the products are balanced in the, the treatment and, uh, and control group. And you can kind of see if, uh, if you do that, the, and if you do this kind of under a, a, a simple structure on the, on the outcome, you're going to do much better than randomizing just the customers or just the, the products, because now you essentially have IJ separate uh, units rather than just I separate uh, units. And, it's, and so it's just going to be, uh, you're going to get much more precise uh, answers than under a standard experiment. Now, let's kind of look at the case that we, we've put the most effort into to understanding uh, the, what we call the simple double randomization uh, design, where we think of randomizing customers into a number of different groups. So we do separate randomization for the customers and uh, the products, and then the assignment is going to be some uh, deterministic function of which group the customer is in and which group the, the product is in. So again, the simplest case is where we assign customers and, and products to two groups, and then we could say that only the people, the selected customers, and only the selected uh, for, are in the treatment group only for the selected uh, uh, products. So you can think now about there being these four types of, uh, of pairs. There's the treated uh, pairs, if both the customer and the product are selected. There's the consistent controls that are uh, where both the customers and the products are in the, the not selected group. There's the inconsistent customer controls where the customers are in the selected set of customers, but the products are not. And so these customers are sometimes in the treatment group, but uh, for these particular products in the control group. And then we have the inconsistent uh, product uh, controls, where the products are sometimes in the treatment group, uh, but not for this particular set of uh, customers. And so what could we uh, look at in that setting? Well, we could compare just the uh, treated versus all the controls. But sort of the more interesting comparisons are looking at the treated out the average outcomes for the treated pairs and comparing that to the average outcome for the consistent uh, controls. In some sense, that gets you the closest within this setting to the total effect of the, of the treatment. Uh, you could learn something about the, the spillovers within products by looking at the inconsistent products versus the consistent controls. You could learn something about the spillovers within the customers by looking at the inconsistent customers versus the consistent controls. And you could look at the difference in difference type comparison. And that's going to tell you something closer to the, the direct effect of the treatment purging out the, the spillover uh, effects. So to kind of to, to look at sort of what you get out of some of these comparisons, uh, let, here let me define for each customer the share of uh, treated products, and for each product the share of, uh, of treated uh, customers. Then kind of one structure we impose on the spillover effects, and so 
and this is not intended to be a particularly realistic one, this is kind of where you would have to think very hard about exactly how these spillovers uh, arise, what they correspond to, why you would be concerned about them. But sort of one the simple structure you could put on that that may, may be reasonable, at least uh, give you reasonable approximation in many cases, is to say that for a pair ij, the only thing that matters for their outcome is whether that particular pair is in the treatment group or not. So for these outcomes to be the same under two matrices, W and W prime, the actual treatment needs to be the same for that uh, pair, but also the share of treated products needs to be the same, and the share of treated customers needs to be the same. So that now the spillovers depend only on the fraction treated customers and the fraction treated products. Now, because at a very high level, that's not very realistic. It's likely that it's some products that matter more than, than others. Uh, but this is to give you an example of the type of structure you may want to put on, and so, so some of the type of structure you need to put on to make, make some progress uh, uh, here. And so essentially what that means is that now the outcome for each uh, pair depends now not just not on the whole matrix, not just on what, which treatment group they're in, but it depends on which treatment they receive as well as the fraction of treated customers for that uh, product and the fraction of treated products for that, uh, that customer. And so th this gives you this exposure mapping that, that reduces the dimension from, from this whole the I by J matrix to just three things. Again, at some level, if you think there's spillovers, these spillovers probably are of the form that if I treat one particular product and one particular customer, that spills over to another product for that customer and then spills over to another customer for that product. So it does kind of go much further. And you, it would be very helpful to kind of come up with with parsimonious models that sort of have some of this autoregressive uh, structure that allows for these, these cascading effects that die off quickly enough so that they don't go very far. But here, to make things simple and to allow us to get kind of exact expressions for variances and stuff, we look at this case where it's restricted to be just purely within a row or within a column of, of these things. But that's unlikely to be realistic in, in many uh, cases. So here's just an example that under these three assignment matrices, even though the matrices are different, the outcome for unit uh, for customer three, product four, is going to be the same because the fraction treated in each in third uh, row in the fourth column is the same in all uh, matrices. And that particular entry of the matrix is always uh, in the treatment group. Now kind, of, now, kind of more generally, you can think of uh, the average outcome, so the average over that whole matrix of all customers and products, of that pair being in the treatment group, sort of being in a particular treatment group, as a function of the fraction of treated uh, customers and the fraction of treated uh, products. And the type of things you may be interested in are what would happen if everybody was exposed, and that would correspond to the difference between mu 111 minus uh, mu 000. The direct effect is keeping the fractions the same, but just changing the first argument of that uh, function, and the spillovers would correspond to changing one of the fractions, but not the other, and not the, the actual treatment. Uh, Now, suppose, that, for example, we're interested in the, the, the overall average effect of uh, being in the, of everybody being exposed to the, to the treatment. If you have a setting where the number of select within this, this simple uh, multiple randomization design, if the number of selected customers and the number of selected products is very large, 
then comparing the outco average outcome for the treated pairs and for the consistent controls would get close to estimating that overall, uh, uh, the overall effect of the, of the treatment, uh, as long as that fraction is, is reasonably large. Uh, now, because making that fraction reasonably large means there's actually very few observations in, that, uh, in the consistent control group. So, so to actually get good estimates, you would need to make that group reasonably large as well. But you would need to make the fraction of the treated ones large to make sure you get close to uh, mu one one. Uh, on the other hand, if you want to get, if you're most interested in the direct effect within this class of designs, you should just have few selected uh, treated uh, customers, few selected customers, few selected products, so that the, the, the spillover effects are, are minimized. Uh, and now this would be much closer to getting this comparison would get much closer to just getting the getting the direct effect. And so in general, you can kind of look at what the averages would be estimating in, uh, in this case, and you can see what comparisons uh, you can actually learn from, uh, uh, from this type of, uh, of experiment. I have till 3.30, is that the? So, so just to show you some of the other things we're doing here, we were interested in understanding how you would do inference uh, for this, and kind of we wanted to do it here the, put us in the, the kind of context of the, the name and type literature, where we want to get the variance of these comparisons coming purely from the, the randomization rather than than combining that with, with model-based um, assumptions. And so we suspected, and that, that turned out to be right, that you can, in fact, get the exact variance for, for that type of, uh, of comparison. Uh, and so you need to define a bunch of, the, the bunch of variances. And what you end up with, for example, for comparing the estimate of the total effect, kind of the average outcome for the treated with the consistent controls, you, would, you get an expression for the variance that involves these uh, nine different components, where the equivalent thing in the, the standard A-B test would have these three components, uh, the variance of the treated outcome, the variance of the control outcome, and the variance of the, the treatment effect. The structure here is very similar where we get a bunch of positive uh, components and then a bunch of negative components that we can't actually estimate directly, the, similar to the way we can't in the, in the name and A-B test setting. And so we, we would be able to estimate consist, sort of unbiasedly the other components, and so we're going to get, be able to get a, the, an estimator for the variance that is, uh, is conservative. Now, you can extend that. Uh, I talked a little bit about how you might want to choose a different design if you wanted to get the direct effect versus if you want to get the total effect. What you could do is, is create more variation in the share of treated uh, customers for different products and more variation in the share of treated customers for the, the different products. And so here, we get all these different sets of, of control pa customer product pairs that have slightly different experiences. There are slightly different experiences in terms of the other products and the other customers. And so what that's going to do is, what that's going to allow you is get a better handle on, on how these outcomes vary, how, how much these spillovers matter, how linear these spillovers are in the fraction treated customers. Uh, and so it's going to give you better handle on extrapolating that to, no, to having a fully consistent experience the, versus a, a fully almost consistent experience of the other type. Now, because in some cases, it is actually not, it's clearly not the fraction of treated products that matters, but just kind of having one or two products that have a, for which the, 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 whether they're in the treatment group that may matter. Kind of, 
if you're used to having the two-day shipping and now they give you one-day shipping for some things, that may directly change your preferences for everything else. So it may, it may not be particularly smooth, but again, that depends on the, on the setting. And having this type of experiment gives you just a lot more information uh, exactly how you would model things, because clearly you don't want to make directly estimate all these uh, contrasts kind of without some structure. So you need to, to exploit, you need to build a model that allows you to integrate all these different uh, comparisons in a, in a way that you can actually uh, use that. But it's just going to be a lot more information in this type of design than, than the simple version where there were just the three uh, sets of control units. And here, obviously, there's also many different sets of treated uh, pairs that, uh, that allow you to, to learn about uh, the spillovers. Um, let me just very briefly kind of make some comments on the, the equilibrium uh, designs. And again, here, there's a lot more work to be done in terms of building models for how these spillovers uh, take place. But if we think that the reason for some of the spillovers is that if a particular uh, product has a lot of treated customers that changes the behavior of where the agent that makes decisions for that product, say the seller, maybe their marketing, maybe their, their price. The, and if we think that, that uh, they set that marketing variable or the price the same way for every customer, but as a function of the fraction of treated customers, then you get these spillovers that these equilibrium designs would be very helpful uh, for. And so you might be interested in that case in what happens if all the, the customers are treated very few or very few customers are treated. And again, it gets you to the point where there's an exposure mapping that now depends on something you don't actually see, namely the, the may not actually see the price or the marketing variable for that particular product and the treatment status for that uh, for that particular uh, pair. So what we could do is split either the products or the customers randomly in two groups. And then for the first set of uh, products, we do a customer experiment. For the second set of products, we do a, a product experiment. And we end up with this, uh, this type of, uh, of design. Now. We could uh, we get these three sets of the customer product pairs. Uh, and so suppose, for example, we, we compare the red seas and the green seas. That's going to tell us something about the spillovers of other customers for the same product being in the, in the treatment group versus the control group. And so that's going to tell us something about these, these spillovers coming uh, from the, the fact that the product, that other aspects of the products are going to be changed as a result of many customers being in the, in the treatment group for that particular uh, product. And so again, that, that's just to illustrate that once you allow, so let me just go back to the, so that's, that we'd be comparing the Red Seas where these, the, this product has a consistent uh, experience with these Green Seas where half the time the customers are in the, in the treatment group. But that's kind of just to illustrate that by creating all these comparisons, we can learn a lot even if we don't see directly what the, the sellers are doing or what the customers are doing how treating some affects uh, other uh, people. And wh where we need to do a lot more work is kind of trying to build models that really capture the type of uh, behavioral spillovers that are going to be uh, salient in a particular uh, setting. So let me, uh, so the final set of, of um, designs I have here on the slides is kind of settings where you might want to, you might be worried about uh, clustering. And so if we do a standard uh, uh, product experiment, we may be 
there, there would be uh, spillovers within the clusters. We can get around that by just doing a cluster randomized experiment. And that, that would be great if all we're interested in the average effect of the, of the treatment, but it wouldn't actually allow us to tell us exposed whether we needed to do that, whether these spillovers actually were big. And so we may also want to know whether these spillovers are actually present so that we know for the future whether we should be doing this type of, uh, of experiments. So you can learn about it in lots of different ways. You could uh, split the, the, the sample into two sets of products and look at and do separate cluster experiments in both the sets. Or you could do the, a cluster experiment for some set of products and a regular product experiment for another set of uh, products that would di very directly allow you to figure out the magnitude of these, uh, these spillovers. So let me then uh, just end. Uh, kind of the exciting thing from this, this project from our perspective is that it just really opens up a lot of possibilities for, for different experimental designs. And kind of even this, this particular class of these designs where we look at these matrices or uh, tensors for the, the assignment isn't really the, the whole end of the story. There's kind of all these other designs that are being considered in, in this new emerging literature. Uh, but the, the key thing is just that once you realize that we're in a world where these spillovers are really intrinsic to what's happening in, the, in these environments, you need to think in the, uh, much bigger in terms of the type of experimental designs you want to consider uh, uh, outside of these, the, the standard A-B tests. Uh, and this is kind of just one example where I think you can learn a lot more from, uh, from doing this type of experiment than from standard uh, experiments. And so the, you know, what the other part that makes it really exciting is that it means there's going to be a lot of need for and room for bringing in economics, bringing in economic modeling about the behavior of, these, uh, of the different agents in these, uh, in these models, in these, in these settings. So that's, that's all I had to say. Nah. Th thanks very much. Perhaps we have time for a couple of questions. Can I lower the mask? Oh, yes. That was a great talk. Uh, thank you. Uh, one quick question on the first part of your design, where you were talking about the, the mu of, let's say, treated, then Q1 and Q2 corresponding to the fraction of row and fraction of columns. So it seems like one of the designs that you recommended could actually capture all possible cues. It would stagger the, uh, stagger the sort of the Cs across rows and columns simultaneously, right? Well, but um, you could have a range of values for QC and a range of values for QP, but you can't vary them completely separately. And that, that sort of goes back to you can't have both the row have all be the, all, the, all the rows be the same and all the, the columns be the same. What if you had, let's say, a uh, quarter of them all Cs, rows, then, sorry, all of them, uh, so quarter rows, all Cs, then remaining quarter, half Cs, then quarter Cs, and then, and then so now if I go to all bottom quarter on the right, then I will have uh, close to one, zero, zero, and then I keep coming back, then I will have all, let's say, 2 to the power minus 2 to the power minus 1. If I did at the all dyadics, I might have. Yeah, so I think you can go fairly far in, in getting the whole, uh, kind of getting that slow, that, that function in a very flexible uh, way. But, you know, with the, the caveat that, so the more groups you create there, kind of the, the, um, the more you have to worry about the precision within any of, of those comparisons. But yeah, so, so it's clear that this type of design would be much more informative 
than just the, the two groups, the two sets of customers, two sets of, uh, of products. Yes. Any other question? Okay, I last one. Uh, so, you know, I agree that you have to do. It, I mean, like you have to put some structure here on the spillovers in order to make some progress. Otherwise, they are like a, you know, the, the uh, you know, a structure. But you know, like that brings like you're doing inference with this type of thing, like a like a name and type of inference that they, you know, even the structure that you would put on the spillover, what is the room for doing randomization inference in this setting? That's an interesting um, question. Um, so, I think so that at the point where you're bringing in these models, you would want to exploit them kind of when you, when you um, do the standard errors as well when you, when you, you try to do, uh, to do inference. The reason we did the inference uh, this way was, was, just pri was primarily to understand whether you could do it this way so that we know the, the, the randomization actually kind of uh, gives you a variance and that it's well defined and you can actually estimate it for these, these different uh, groups. But it, uh, in the end, kind of the, you know, the fact that this particular design only allows us to estimate these four, four groups. It's sort of, it's clear that simple comparisons of these things are not the things you're interested in. So you, you do have to put on some more structure. And at that point, you may want to modify your inference to take, a, take account of that. But we want to just understand whether the intuition coming from, from the standard experimental design was still valid, that you can do inference based purely on the, on the assignment. Uh, so we felt it helped us understand the, the nature of the problem more than that we would recommend that that's actually the, the particular way to do inference. And that once you kind of look at the, the variance expressions, in practice, you would probably not be worried about particular terms and make, approxi make approximations based on the fact that both I or NJ, or at least one of them, may be fairly large, so particular things are going to, to drop out. But th this was more an exercise in making sure we understood the, the nature of the, of the problems there. Okay, thank you, Hido, for the uh, very nice talk. And uh, please, uh, like you and me, give me a hand. Thank you.